Good morning. It's good to see each of you. Our closing hymn today will be hymn number 366. If you'd like to turn and hold that in readiness. My name is Tootie McNamara. <laughs> I'm glad to see each of you here. That, I mean, I want my name to be Tootie. I mean, don't you just smile when, when you say, yeah, I, the paperwork's not done yet, but I'm going to change my name. I'm, you know, I'm glad to see all of you guys made it to church this morning. Got a lot of visitors here today. I'm, I, I think I still feel like a visitor myself. Glad you guys got out of bed this morning. I'm reminded of a story of the a mother who went to wake up her son to get ready for church. She said, son, it's time to go to church. He said, I'm not going. She said, why not? He said, I'll give you two reasons. They don't like me, and I don't like them. <laughs> she said, I'm going to give you two reasons why you need to go to church. You're 59 years old, and you're the pastor. <laughs> I am 59 years old. My name is Mike, and I couldn't wait to get to church this morning. I'm so glad to see you guys. Judy and I have been overwhelmed with your welcome and your love and your care and your concern and your food and your gifts and your prayers. And I mean, if this isn't heaven, it'll do till it gets here. Amen. This is a great, great church. And uh, what a wonderful secret. When the secret gets out, we're not going we're gonna to have to get in tight and squeeze together because when the secret gets out about Draper Christian Church, this church is going to be packed. I guarantee it because you guys have the one ingredient that it's going to take to make the church grow, and that's the love that you have for Christ and the love that you have for one another. Now, I want to correct, and I, I never would ever, ever correct a senior statesman or an elder uh, uh, like Mr. Fred Hand. Uh, doesn't he look kind of presidential when he stood up here this morning? I, I mean, I say, let's go, let's Fred for president. That's what I'm thinking. But I, I, I'd hate to correct him, but I do want to correct him a little bit. I am not the answer to your problem. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I can't save you, and I can't fix your problems. This church can't save you, and it can't fix your problems. But the Christ of this church can save you and fix your problems. And if we stay focused on Christ, all of the things that we need in this lifetime are going to be fixed and our problems are going to be solved, and guess what? We're going to get to do. What are we going to get to do, Stephen? We're going to get to go to heaven, aren't we, brother? Yeah. Now, don't you love Stephen back there? Yeah, I'm going to wear my shirt. I got a shirt just like Stephen's. I'm going to wear it next week, okay? <laughs> All right. So somebody asked me, uh, Mike, how, what message are you going to start off with? What, what's your lead pitch going to be at this, this new church of yours? And... Uh, I said, well, man, I, I said, you know, i got to lead with my best pitch, and my best pitch is love. But it's sort of like these guys already got a corner on the market on love, don't they? Yeah. Uh, but I'm sort of like what I feel like the Apostle Paul when he was church, talking to the church at Thessalonica. He says, about love, I don't need to write to you, but here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you all the more to love more and more. And so our text today is going to be 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, and we're going to talk about love today, okay? And so let's get right into the message. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Here's what it says. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Today, we're going to learn how to love one another more deeply. Now, verse 22, it starts off, now that you have purified yourselves. What Paul's reminding, or rather Peter's reminding his readers is that earlier in the chapter, he told them that the one thing that you needed to do as you begin to look at around your life and see the problems that are happening in your world is you need to purify yourselves. You need to become holy as God is holy. And once you've done that, now you're ready. Uh, once you've made that commitment, now you're ready to put your faith into action in your community. And here's what he says 
Here's how you put your faith into action. Have sincere love for each other. That word love is from the Greek Philadelphia. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Philadelphia, we know, is a city that was founded by William Penn, the Quaker, and it is known as the what? City of brotherly love, right? You know, in researching the naming of that city, I found this. William Penn chose boldly, aiming for the vault of heaven, daring irony to strike. The name he gave his city combined the Greek words for love and brother, setting up the enduring civic name, the city of brotherly love. I like that phrase in there. He was aiming for the vault of heaven. What would be in heaven's vault if it had a great big safe? All the love of God, the most precious thing in the world. And so William Penn was aiming for the vault of heaven to name the city of Philadelphia. Now in 1967, Draper, Leaksville, and Spray, something happened, didn't it? Somebody tell me what happened to Leaksville, Draper, and Spray in 1967. And they became known under a new name, right? What was the name? What's the name? Eden. Eden. That's where we're at, Eden, North Carolina, right? Now, Bernie tells me uh, that in 1968, he took a little hiatus from Kentucky Christian, and he went back to Kentucky Christian, and one of his buddies said, Bernie, uh, do you still live in the same place? He said, you know what? I live on the same street. I live in the same house, I have the same mailbox, I have the same mailman, and I have the same telephone number, but I live in a different town. <laughs> you guys ever heard that story? <laughs> Bernie's told it to me a couple of times. <laughs> and that's all right, isn't it? We love Bernie, don't we? Now, I want you to think of your city that you live in. I want you to think of a new name. I want you to think of your town as comprised of all the people that you come in contact with every day. That's your town. That's your city. And I want you to give your city a name. Thinking of the circle of influence that you have individually in your own town, could your city be called the city of brotherly love? Or would it be called something else? How do you treat the people in your circle of influence. God's word says that we're to treat everybody we meet with brotherly love, Philadelphia love. Brotherly love for those that are near us. Brotherly love is family love. Certainly that kind of love extends to our family. It extends to our friends, to our co-workers people that, uh, that we meet in our community. It extends to the grocery store clerk. It extends to the waitress. It extends to the guy at the tire store. It extends to your church family. Brotherly love, the love that God has called you into, is to extend to every person you come in contact with. Peter says this is the kind of love that you are to have for everyone that is near you. Brotherly love. So treat everyone in your circle of influence with family love, Philadelphia love. One of the implications about this brotherly love is that we're to have genuine concern for one another. We're to care about people's needs. We're to care when people are hurting. We're to care about their well-being in your circle of love. I love that. We have a circle of love here, don't we? Meets here on Tuesday night. It's going to meet here on this Tuesday night. And uh, I'm not invited to it, but they tell me it's an awesome place to be. But you know what? I have a circle of love, and it's the people that I come in contact with every day. They love me, and I love them. And that's my job, and that's your job. But how do we, how do we show people that we care? How do we show people that we care in our love circle? Well, the first thing we need to do is to listen carefully when others speak. And, and I'm not talking about that kind of distracted listening. Now, I've got to work on this. I really do. I, I get busy doing things, and I know you do too. And I'll be busy doing something, and somebody will come up to me, and they'll start talking, and I'll keep doing what I'm doing, and, and I'll look over and listen. Is that, 
Is that really listening? You know what we need to do? We need to stop what we're doing, square up, look in their eyes, and listen. Not distracted listening. I need to work on that because I can get busy and you can get busy. Uh, and, and another thing that we can do to show people that we care, that we're really listening to them, is uh, to not redirect the subject back on us. Have you ever done that? I talked to somebody just the other day, said they were in a car accident in Walmart parking lot. I guess that happens quite a bit. I, and, and, you know, I, I, was in, I was in a car accident in Walmart parking lot. And what do we do? Oh, you know what? The same thing happened to me about a year ago. And you know what they're going to do? They're, they're not going to say it. They're not going to say it. They're going to be really nice. But in their head, they're thinking, I thought we were talking about me. And here, all of a sudden, you want to talk about you. I just got in an accident. You're talking about something that happened to you a year ago. Here's what we ought to do to really show that we care. You know, God gave us what? Two ears and one mouth. We're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk, right? But, and so if we really want to listen to people, uh, what we need to do is ask them to tell us more. So tell me more about that. So you got in an accident. Oh, goodness, are you okay? Did the groceries make it home? Do you need a ride somewhere? Uh, do I need to call, call Mark Ellis to see if you need a new car? <laughs> Mark, you'll hook him up, won't you, brother? Amen. He said he'll do it. But you, you know what happens when you really listen to people? It shows that you care about them. And so in our circle of love, we need to listen to people. Let people finish what they're talking about. And then after they're done, you know what they might do? They might say, has anything like that ever happened to you? And then, boy, you get to run in there and tell your little story. But let people finish. Here's another thing you can do. Uh, to show love for one another is to convey a little kindness. When I was a kid in Southern Maryland, my dad's a retired master gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps, so you, if any of you uh, military folks know what kind of childhood I had growing up, oorah, right? Yeah, give me 20, right? Uh, but uh, uh, when I was a kid growing up in Southern Maryland, one of the places my dad was stationed was Patuxent River Air Base, but every year they'd have a Christmas parade. And as a kid, I loved to go to that Christmas parade, and I loved my favorite thing was when the Santa Claus float would come by, and Santa would have a great big bag. He wouldn't have toys in it. It was full of candy, and Santa would reach down in there, and he'd grab a handful of candy, and he'd just start throwing it out. You guys ever been to a parade like that? Oh, man, you, you want to catch that candy? You know, just a little, little love coming at you, you know, a little kindness coming your way. You know, that's the kind of love we ought to have for each other. We ought to show kind of random acts of kindness, a little care and a little concern. Here are some phrases that you can toss out like little sweet kindnesses. Good job. You know, man, it's good to see you. You know, I prayed for you yesterday. Thank you. I want you to have a great day. How about this one? I love you. Has anybody told you I love you today? I love you. You say, well, if I say it all the time, it'll become trite. Let me tell you what. If I didn't tell my wife I love her about 10 times a day, she would probably start wondering if I loved her. I got a reminder. You know, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. It doesn't become trite. You stop doing it. I'll tell you what, that's when you're going to have some problems. Go ahead and tell people you love them while you have a chance. You may say, well, um, you know, it just becomes trite, but it won't. Peter says, find ways to do Philadelphia love to one another. Find ways to love people in your circle. Secondly, have sincere, that's what I want to fo focus on, sincere love for one another. Now, the Greek word there is actually a negative term. It means do not pretend. The word sincere here in our text means do not pretend. It's, it's like don't, put on, don't, don't be fake about it. You know, be genuine about it. How do we show authentic, true, genuine, reliable love for one another? The New Testament says that Christians are to live out their faith not only in words, 
but in deeds. So here's a way that we can show sincere faith. Love is action, not just words. You know, words are cheap, aren't they? But actions speak louder than words. John, the apostle, put it this way. In 1 John 3.16, we heard our elder quote John 3.16. This is 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So how can we show sincere love for one another? By actions, by putting our words into action. Back to Peter. God wants Christians to love more deeply by word and deed. And when we do it by deed, we show genuine, authentic love for one another. Now, Peter doesn't let us off the hook there. Throughout the entire epistle of 1 Peter, he gives us some clues along the way of what we need to do. How can we put this love into action? The first thing he says is to be hospitable, to be welcome, warm, warm and friendly. And he says that in 1 Peter 4, 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, I want you to know that in the New Testament time, hospitality was a big deal. I mean, it was a virtue that uh, if you didn't show hospitality, well, everybody else kind of looked down on you. I mean, it was that important for New Testament Christians to show hospitality to one another. I mean, they would go to great length when a stranger would come around. They would open up their homes. They would go to their neighbors if they didn't have food and borrow food so that they could feed the stranger. I mean, hospitality was a big deal. But, you know, every once in a while, like y'all humans, uh, they would grumble a little bit and complain. But Paul, uh, Peter says, don't show hospitality and complain at the same time. Let it be real. You know, we, uh, it ought to be easy for us here in North Carolina, right? Because we're in the South, and there's nothing like Southern hospitality. We've experienced that here. And I know you guys do that, but I want to encourage you all the more as, as we go throughout our love circle to reach out to folks with hospitality. Another uh, point that Peter makes in 1 Peter 4.10 is that we're to show sincere love by serving and meeting needs. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So what does that mean? Every time you do something... In the church, every time you do something for somebody in your love circle, that's Christian love. That's serving others. And we can do that. You know, we do little tasks around the church, uh, which shows love for others. Here's a few more. I mentioned random acts of kindness, you know, just lending a helping hand. You guys can add to the list of things that you can do for people in your circle of influence to show them sincere love. Thirdly, have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. Now, you might say, well, you know, Peter, aren't you just kind of repeating yourselves? Well, you know, preachers do have a tendency to do that. Um, I'm glad we're starting service at 10 o'clock. We might actually get out of here by 12, you know, normally. <laughs> That's a good thing. But, but he's not repeating himself here. Peter is using a different word for love. The first word that he used for love was Philadelphia. The word he used here is agape. It's a different kind of love. It's a love that you choose to do. Agape love is unconditional love. See, brotherly love is from the heart. It, it kind of comes from our feelings. You know, I, I like you. You like me. You know, and, and I want to do something good for you, right? Agape love is quite different. Agape love comes from the head. I don't really care for you, <laughs> but I'm going to love you any way. Isn't that how God loves us? 
The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. God loves sinners. God loves saints. God loves nice people. He loves ornery people, right? And we're to have the same kind of love. How does God do that? Not from his feelings, necessarily. He does it because he makes a choice to love. And that's what agape love is. It's a mental thing. It's not a heart thing. Heart things are good, but sometimes you've got to make a decision to love people. That's what God did for us. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't do anything to deserve that love, but he loved us anyway. And when we begin to understand agape love, that it is not a feeling, it is a choice that we make every day when we wake up. Today, when I get out of bed and I get into my love circle and my circle of influence and I meet people that I know that kind of rub me the wrong way, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a choice to love them anyway. I'm going to make a choice to do at random acts of kindness to them. I'm going to make a choice to smile at them and to be kind to them. And when we understand, begin to understand agape love, we can understand the teachings of Christ much, much better. Listen to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, You have heard that it was said, Love your enemies, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, the righteous and the unrighteous. Agape love loves everyone. And we can make a choice to love people in our circle no matter what. And when we make that choice, you know what? We're imitating God's love. If there's somebody in your circle of influence that you meet, that you're kind of at odds with, this week, make a decision. You know what? I'm going to turn the tide on that relationship. I'm going to go out of my way to do something nice for that person who just irritates the snot out of me. <laughs> now, I, you, you guys probably don't have anybody like that in your life. But you may. Agape love says, I'm going to be loving, kind, patient, and caring, even if you don't deserve it. And that's what God does for us, isn't it? He's what it did for me. He's what it, it's what he done for you. Agape love says, I'm not going to respond in the same way. I'm going to respond with love. Now, did the waitress who waited on you last week have an attitude? She forget to bring you that side dish that you asked for or fill your water glass? Was she a little bit rude, a little bit testy? You know what? Maybe she's hurting. And maybe she could use some love. Maybe that uh, guy who you took your car to, who normally does a really good job, maybe he forgot to rotate your tires. Maybe he forgot to put that little plug under there where the oil comes out, you know? How, how, did you, how did you treat him? You know, maybe he just found out that his wife has breast cancer and he was completely, you know, taken out of his normal routine. Instead of being rude back to the waitress, instead of blessing out the mechanic who just burned up your motor, we got Mark Ellis. We can get another car. <laughs> Be nice. Find some way to show undeserved agape love to everyone that you meet. Isn't that truly aiming for the vault of heaven when we do that? I mean, agape love is rising above the fray. Agape love is rising above our feelings. Agape love is elevating the spirit that God has given us in Christ Jesus to another plane, to another level. And as we do that, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to heaven. And we'll be able to reach up and pull down the love 
that God has given us and give it to others.